after being able to just get all that out in prayer. And you know, if we'd start every service that way, I think our church would just bloom out. I really do. Christian, I just want to say this from your pastor. Um, I love you. I'm praying for you and your family. I know you're praying for us. And uh, don't panic. Don't, don't do anything, um, you know, rash or rude or ugly. Uh, you know, that's not the Christian's tactics. And let's not lower ourselves to any of these tactics, uh, you know, baiting us, uh, wanting us to come back to them or retaliate. That's, remember who we are, remember who we represent. And I know we all feel a little bit ugly. We feel like we've been beat up and uh, rightfully so. But let's hold our head up. Let's keep looking up. Our redemption draweth nigh and uh, keep it positive. Uh, you know, this is our opportunity. People are hurting right now. People are very oppressed right now. They're very uh, disenfranchised with our country, our government, um, life in general. There's a lot of people that's probably wanting to give up and throw in the towel, quit Christianity, quit everything, and just be a hermit the rest of their life. Then if that's the life they so choose, that's not the right route. But, you know, we are living in America. Just be a blessing to folks. Let's just be friends. Uh, be friendly with people. And I have a message, if God lets me preach it on Sunday morning. If you have anyone who has problems, uh, remember what I said about being disenfranchised. If you have someone who <clears throat> maybe perhaps has an addiction, whether it's drugs, alcohol, a licentious lifestyle, uh, something that has grabbed their attention and made them swerve way off course. They're not the same person they used to be. They're, they're definitely not the same person they used to be. It can happen. Uh, we're going to find out about what happened to a person in the Bible. Uh, I would say he is a very godly man. It happened to him. That's all I can tell you. It happened to him. And if it can happen to this man, this great character in the Bible, who God called a preacher of righteousness, it can happen to us. It can happen to us. And so, you know, we're not here to pass judgment on anyone. I'll try my best to keep my, my manners good and not to point the finger at anybody. I just want to show you how far a person can go and uh, also how God can restore and bring them back up. And that's what we need. We need restoration in our country right now. We need renewal. We need revival. Any kind of message like this to not to draw attention to the sin. Anybody can point the sin problem out. But let's see if God can come in there and uh, bring healing where that sin affected their life so severely. My goodness. And uh, boy, I don't know if you have any friends or any family uh, that is just uh, riddled with these problems. But I do. And my wife and I, we pray for them. And this just now I was moved uh, thinking about, you know, um, if we go to heaven soon, I think it's very soon. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus, right? That's not an exit strategy. This is an opportunity for evangelism for these, our loving family members and loved ones, who we fear will not go with us. I mean, this is an opportunity now. If this is a last-ditch effort on the church's part to make sure that everybody we know, uh, name them by name, call them out by name, make a list, uh, you know, do something nice for them. That, I mean, if you've had a, uh, you know, some sort of uh, disagreement and there's a breach in the relationship, um, kill them with kindness. Just go overboard. Just, just act out of character and uh, just do it right. I mean, just, just treat them so nice they'll know something's up. <laughs> something's not right here. But uh, I think, I really think the Lord would want us to be kind uh, during this time because, I mean, anybody can act up. Anybody can act up. I'm not saying what happened uh, today is right uh, in the least. I'm not for violence. I'm not for violence. I'm not a violent person. Tonight we're in Genesis chapter number 10. Uh, and I'm just going to read you the verses. Where this is like a springboard message, a little bit different kind of message tonight. And maybe it will take our mind off of everything going on in the world. That's what I really want. I don't want to think about all that ugly stuff, Sister Dawn. I don't want to think about 
I'd rather think about the Lord, His Word. And so Genesis chapter 10, uh, 8 and 9, And Cush begat Nimrod. We're talking about these genealogies of uh, Noah's three sons, uh, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And he began to be mighty, a mighty one in the earth. And he, this really caught my attention, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And so uh, who is he doing it for? It seems like he was doing this to please the Lord. I think everything we do, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, do all to the what? Glory of the Lord. And so as he says here, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. He must have recognized the Lordship uh, of God. And it says, wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. So uh, he was a mighty hunter, and he was known as a mighty hunter before the Lord. And so this is a little verse tucked away in Scripture about an obscure man who lived in an obscure age and uh, he, he, uh, he, he was mighty in the earth and simply put because he was a mighty hunter. Now these were the days when, uh, you know, people uh, were mighty not because they were a ball player or not because they had, you know, a portfolio of Wall Street. Uh, people back during this era were mighty because they could take down a big game. They could outthink, outsmart, outwit these uh, opponents in the field. And if you don't think that the deer are smart, try to get one for yourself. I've been trying a long time, and I, I'm looking for them. And so, uh, so God said uh, in Genesis 1:26, "Let us make man in our image." But it does take the stress down. I guess it does. I'm, I'm working on that. Uh, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let us have dominion over, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. So right after God said, let us make man in our image, notice the plurality there of the Godhead, the three personages, let us make man in our image. Talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And he said, let us have dominion over the fish. Whoop, you fishermen ought to say, praise the Lord right there. Let us have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and all the every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So right after God said, let us make man in our image, he basically said, man is going to have enough to eat. I'm going to teach them how to provide for themselves through all of these creatures on the earth. They're here for them to enjoy. Be fruitful and multiply, Genesis 1, 28. How many is reading through your Bible? This is where I'm getting all this. Okay, a few of you. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. That's not the voting machine right there. Over the fish of the sea. I did have to bring something up political tonight. I had to get you to laugh a little bit. Is it okay to laugh? Yeah. You know a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Sister uh, Marie uh, Hornsby would tell us that now, wouldn't she? Yeah. And she would cackle and she would laugh and she, she just... She would bounce in this place looking like she'd come off of Fifth Avenue, and she'd have her hair done. I don't care what time of the day or night you saw her, she was, she was fixed, amen, she was there. And uh, we don't know how she did it, but uh, what a personality is all I can tell you, what a personality. And so uh, God said He wanted us to take dominion over the fish of the fowl, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth, Genesis 1, 28. In other words, God made this earth for us. He wanted us to be in charge. He wanted us to take dominion. He wanted us to be the authority. And so I see that this man by the name of Nimrod, I want to entitle tonight's message, The Mighty Hunter. Number one, I see, so God, the very time that He made Man in his image, think on this now, just afterwards, he made him with instructions of how to feed himself. Is that not good? I mean, he built a bonanza steakhouse. I mean, really. He said, <laughs> over the cattle. I got that, didn't you? I mean, I'm not a vegetarian. I am not a vegetarian. I find T-bone steaks right there in that passage. 
I see sirloin on the pages of the Word of God. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to have a fit in here tonight. Somebody ought to shout the victory over that. You know why? I mean, life's too short to be dull and boring. Life is too short to eat a, 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 a sweet pea all your life. You know what I'm saying? I mean, look, I mean, <laughs> we, we are down here. God doesn't want us to go through misery. He wants to take care of us. He wants to feed us good. I think all of us are doing pretty good. Thank you, Brother Donald. I'm glad I got an amen out of Donald. That's the first amen I've had out of you. How long now? I talked about the T-bone steak. That's what it was right there, Donna. So, you know, I was thinking about all these things in lieu of being a hunter. And, uh, you know, not too long ago I, I was killing some deer and I was throwing away this, the rib cages of the deer and the carcass. And, you know, it came to me, God, I guess it was God that spoke to my heart and He said, you know, you're throwing away a lot of this food and this meat. I, I gave it to you. You're going you're gonna to take some of it, but you're not going to take the rest of it. You don't like that part of it? And I thought about that just for a minute. I thought about what would Mimi do? All right. You know, they ate every ounce of the pig, even the, the tail, the feet, the head, everything. And don't laugh at that when you eat, uh, what do you call this, uh, bologna? Yeah, when you eat that, I'm not going to tell you what you're eating, but it's, far, it's everything. So anyway, that's another story. But I said, God, if you'll let me kill some deer, I promise you I'll keep the rib cage from now on. It's a little harder on my wife because, of course, I, you know, cut it up for her. But she's stewing this thing down. And it takes how long, Mrs. Crane? Hours and hours and hours and hours. But you won't believe this. The deer hash is second to none, and it comes off the rib cage. We were throwing out the hash. My daughter Jenny, I'm talking about Jenny, uh, you know, she's uh, uh, probably the most refined of all of our children. And, uh, I mean, she is dignified. She's in a dignified family now. And so <laughs> she married out of our family to get the dignification. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, but at some, some points, uh, quite a few times, especially in the winter months, she'll call and she'll say, Mama, I'm hungry for some deer hash. Now, what is that? I'm thinking, okay, uh, that has to be back in the, the DNA way back there when we came from Arkansas, you know, when they ate squirrels and rabbits. And, oh, listen, my grandmother would give my grandfather, uh, you know, uh, the numbers of squirrel each day and rabbits to feed the entire family during the Depression. And he was such a good hunter, he would bring in everything that the woman wanted and flop it down there, you know. And my wife and I, uh, we were just, uh, I'm going to say just the first few years of marriage, we'd driven back up from Orlando to Arkansas, which is a long way for Christmas. But I took, don't listen, Brother Chris, I took the whole two weeks of my vacation at Christmas. We visited with his family. We went hunting and such. Didn't kill anything. And Grandpa Roper knew we hadn't killed anything. He'd come over there and he'd say, Young, has y'all got any meat yet? <laughs> Knowing we didn't have any. He said, I think I can fix it. He said, give me one hour. Don't leave just yet. We was about to pull off. He said, don't leave just yet. Give me one hour. He said, I'll have you some meat. How does a man make that kind of brag? In one hour, he's going to go down there and get something and bring it back to us. And we're watching and waiting and looking, anticipating this thing. I'm going to say in less than 30 minutes, am I right, Miss Crane? He came dragging this deer up. And, of course, I helped him to skin it. But I'm telling you, these people back in the, in the era where, they, I mean, their life depended on food from the field and fruit, food from the woods, they knew how to hunt and they made every bullet count. Yeah. My uncle, whenever he shoots down there, and I'm shoot, he was a marine sniper. <laughs> yeah, there's books written about my, bro, my uncle from Arkansas. And, and so when he shoots, he can't hear worth a lick because he, all this bombardment during Vietnam, can't hear, but boy, his eyes and his, uh, uh, his ability to perceive and when he shoots, we knew there's meat in the pot. So you understand when we're, de when we're talking about <clears throat> this man tonight, what's his name again? Nimrod. Yeah, Nimrod. When we're talking, I'm just seeing if you're listening. Uh, <laughs> we're, 
when we're talking to this man named Nimrod and God says, you know, not one of those exaggerated stories, not, not something that we, we, you know, we Baptist preachers kind of whatever expound upon. But when God says this man was a mighty hunter, whoo, man, he, he, was, he must have been such a good hunter. And what about it? He was providing for his family, no doubt. And he was thought about, he was thought by all of his friends and all of his peers as someone who was mighty before the Lord. He was given honor and glory to the Lord even in his hunting. So let me ask the question, when we go hunting, when we go bowling, when we go fishing, when we do anything, should we not give glory to God in it? Why don't we pause just a minute before we make the first bowl, fellas. Say a little prayer here before we get hurt out here. We could slip on that, and I have. Whoop. I mean, you know, you get one inch on that lane, and you're out there and up in the air. I've done it. Oh, anybody else? I thought I was wiping the floors the last time the men went over there to the bowling alley. But uh, to praise the Lord, hey, uh, look, I, I, this, is, this is something that we should, I think we should instill in the hearts of our young boys. Learn how to get out in the woods. Learn how to be, uh, listen, uh, to watch the creation. I think it teaches a lot of good disciplines. It teaches how to appreciate, it teaches you how to have discipline and patience and, and a lot of virtues you're not going to get anywhere else. And then just to enjoy the beauty that God put down here on the earth. And learning how to provide for, look, what if we did have to go back to those days that granddaddy and grandma lived in? I want five squirrels this morning for breakfast. I'll put biscuits with it if you'll bring it, but if you don't, no biscuits for you. I can only imagine how she motivated. I don't know how she did it. First Timothy 5 and 8, but if any provide not for his own and especially for his uh, own house, the Bible says he's denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So God said a person that's not providing, you know I think we're dependent too much on what man can do for us, what man can provide for us. But God says if we're not being dependent on Him and working to achieve this goal, we have denied the faith. We're no longer with God. We're not working. We're not serving our families and providing for our families. And so, you know, uh, just thinking about uh, this very time when God made man in His image, He made the instructions to go along with the package to feed, huh, to feed their families with. I'm thinking about my grandma and grandpa. They got married in 1928. Now think on this. One day, one year before the uh, the fall and the Depression years, the fall of the uh, Wall Street, and people were jumping out of buildings. You've you've heard all the stories. They were committing suicides, and down on the farm. Uh, grandma and Grandpa, that life didn't change much for them because they, Mama said they was poor before Depression. They was poor during the Depression. They was poor after the Depression. And, and just give you a little insight, is it okay if we just give you some testimonies of back then? They went to the courthouse to get married. They didn't have big fancy weddings like they have now. Justice of the Peace was going to marry them. But the Justice came down to the car and they got married in this... Uh, I don't know what kind of car it was, but it was a convertible. It must have been one of those long, large vehicles because they're not the only one that got married that day. There was two couples in the car in a convertible, and they stood up, and the justice said, you're married now in about two minutes. And that was it. He signed the papers, and they never got out of the car. They just rode off as husband and wife. It must have been good because they was married for over 60 years. Nowadays, if everything's not just going, you know, perfect, you know, they kind of forget and fudge on those oaths and think different things about, uh, you know, the commitment that they made there. But that's another story, and we'll learn more about that at the marriage retreat. But, hey, you know, uh, God, uh, I, I'm thinking about, uh, he, he put the instruction, the instruction manual was given to man on how to provide for himself. Think on that just a minute. If you put a wild animal in a cage and domesticate him, 
and you feed him and you pamper him and you put foo-foo powder on him and, and, and try to make him a, a, a play toy. And they, they succeed at that. I've seen many an animal that was domesticated. And then you release that animal back out in the wild, what do you have? Yeah, he cannot protect himself. He is vulnerable and his predators will take him under. And so I think a lot of the things that is going on uh, in our country today is decade upon decade of man becoming dependent upon a government that was never intended to take care of them to begin with. It's kind of like the, those poor people on the reservation. Uh, I study that scenario a while and see uh, all of these people that are so terribly dependent, and we're talking about addiction message for Sunday, but most of them are so addicted to alcohol. It's pitiful conditions. Uh, we support the dear brother uh, to the Zuni Indians out uh, in New Mexico, uh, and uh, Brother Josh knows him well, Brother Russell. Aaron, uh, how long were you out there, Brother Josh, helping? Six whole years, and his mom and dad moved out there to help. And uh, I'm sure you've seen a lot of this addictions that I'm talking about. And it's terrible, isn't it? And the same could be said of us. God made us to be independent. God made us to provide for ourselves. God made us to, uh, you know, not, not be uh, dependent upon a government or anyone else. And, and I think the same way about me being an independent Baptist. Now, I must confess I'm much of a, uh, I guess I'm the black sheep of the family. Both my, my dad and my grandfather were in the association. But I never wanted to be, even though my first church was in the association, I never wanted to be dependent on a group of, or an organization or association other than the Lord. I, I mean... Uh, if you think about it, uh, I could have been very much dependent. I could have climbed my way up the rung of ladders uh, like so many uh, in the, uh, the denominations do this. Uh, and uh, I could put my name in and the opportunities do come up at their associational meetings and when the churches are without. Uh, and many of the, uh, the men wait for, wait, uh, they're very patient, but they wait for uh, the, the larger churches and the more successful churches uh, in time come open and they're dependent on this system. I've seen it folks firsthand. They're dependent on that and not God. When if someone would just sell out and find a city, my dad said, son, if you're not called to start churches like me, don't do it. Now, don't you dare do it. He said, you find you a city. You find you a people that love God. You put your roots down. You find yourself a place that God calls you. And you just put your anchor down, put your roots down, and stay put. That's what my dad told me to do. And so that's when we have to be dependent on God because we don't have all the fringes. We don't have all the perks. We don't have any money coming from any group or association. We have to depend on the Lord. And so our dependence is on man when we are in uh, a lot of these inventions of man and uh, not of the Lord. We all know Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. But do we ever apply that to specifically, to specifics? Lean not unto thine own understanding. <laughs> in all thy ways acknowledge him, he shall direct thy paths. He knows the way we should take, doesn't he? I love the old song. I learned it when I was a junior, uh, junior high boy, junior boy uh, at camp in the summer in Pensacola. And my Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. Then I want to say Nimrod became mighty by being dependent on God and not on what man could feed him rather than but what he could find for himself. He let God help him. You know, God's ways are past our ways, which means you'll turn out a lot better if you go with God than if you went with your own understanding. 
I mean, even if it looks more, uh, you know, as far as uh, very uh, lucrative, uh, if it looks like it's very, very uh, much uh, good for you to do it, you better be sure God's in it. Every mistake I've ever made, I did it rashly. I got ahead of God. I got way out in front of God. And I wish a thousand times I didn't do it. But God, of course, redeems us. Uh, praise the Lord. And He brings us back to where we should be. But look, God look, doesn't want a system in place, uh, whether it's political or religious or socioeconomic, to be the reason. God doesn't want this to be the reason that for our demise, for our downfall. God wants to get involved in our life, in every area of our life. The descendants of Ham, born to Cush, a great hunter, before the Lord came out of their lineage. And it's because he depended on the Lord. Everyone knew this man as someone great because he totally depended on the Lord. He didn't have a rich uncle. He didn't have, uh, you know, Abraham said, I'll not take of the spoils of Sodom because people will say that I got rich from Sodom and Gomorrah. He wouldn't take a penny of it. I don't want to die with the devil's money. How about you? And you know, uh, as bad as the depression got, people were committing suicide because they lost all. But uh, you know, those that were dependent on God, like my, my parents and other Christians during that time, they didn't lose their mind. Amen. Folks, during this time of, of, of chaos and during this time of un civil unrest, don't lose it. Don't, don't let yourself go into those areas. Don't let yourself think the worst. Don't let yourself think doomsday is here. Now, the only time we're going to heaven is when God calls the number, and not until then, and we're to go on singing. Amen? Amen. And so after this terrible crash of the Depression, uh, you know, uh, my parents uh, were married in 47, and uh, they married, and they were little, very simple life, very simple life. And, uh, you know, it was on the farm, and, and uh, my dad soon, uh, I think in 46, he actually attended uh, Baylor University. I could have easily been in the association, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but, uh, but God's providence, you see, God knows the way. God takes us down these paths. He uses our, 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 our genealogy. He uses those that went before us. Surely, they paved the trail uh, for a lot of us uh, where we are in life and what they did. Uh, many of the th same things they do did, we do today because they, they made some mistakes. We don't want to have to make those same mistakes to learn the lessons that they learned. We learn from them. And we, we, are, we are where we are tonight. Don't you think you're here because of your own doings? You're here because of the grace of God. Amen. And you're here tonight because of godly examples that were set before you. And if you're a first uh, generation Christian here tonight, thank God for you. And just come on in. The water's fine and there's plenty of room and we need you here and we're happy for you. And Brother Joe, what you're doing with this couple up in Canada, I'm just getting bits and pieces of it. Son, that's what we're all supposed to be doing. And I went over today to try to find your dad. I just love his fellowship. I, I, last week we fellowshiped with him. Or was it week before last maybe? And uh, just a, a swell fellow. He comes and visits our church. He got saved right here. And I baptized him. And it been so many years ago. But I'm, that's what I'm saying. Uh, like, like father, like son. Uh, like, like, like you, your children. Uh, they, they may not be exactly where you want them to be now. But don't, don't move where you are. Because if you move, then when they do come back, you've left your place. And they're going to be so far away from where they need to be. And I will say this in closing. This is the last point. Don't, I know people shudder when I say in closing. You know, count on 25 more minutes. <laughs> I'm not going to make it that long. I'm tired. I want to go home. The, the application tonight is this. Some of you love that. We like Nimrod. We have to nurture. Uh, excuse me. We have the nature to hunt things. We, we're hunters. We have that instinct. We, we want things. We, you know, and, and if you want it bad enough, you can get it. And what you emphasize, I've often said, whatever you emphasize, that's who you, you'll become. You know? uh, who you hang around, your associations uh, of people. And so uh, 
uh, if it's animal, mineral, water, uh, whatever it is, if it's indecent or decent, whether it's moral or immoral, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, something that's going to uh, make your testimony better or worse, it all depends on choices you make in life. And so, if you're looking for it long enough, and if you just keep searching for it, you know, even a hog sometimes, he'll find a kernel of corn. What I'm saying is, make sure what you're seeking after and what you're hunting for is what God wants you to hunt for, okay? Because you can search all your life. What about what Jesus said about not casting your pearl before the swines? You, you can go after things that you shouldn't go after, and, and you don't want to do that. And so, uh, you, you know, nowadays, talking about hunters, nowadays the big craze is there's lady hunters. And I hate to say this, men, but I, I think they, they're, they're pretty good at it. I'd never say they were better than the men, but boy, I can see some of the pictures of the deers that they're killing, and I'm thinking, and they got me out, they got me whipped. Yeah, and there's a site you can go on. Uh, I killed it in Mississippi, and I'm watching these big old horned deer, uh, you know, uh, that these ladies are killing, and I'm thinking to myself, uh, uh, you know, I just, I just can't hardly believe the size of the deer in the state of Mississippi. We've got some of the largest deer. Uh, herds in uh, in the whole, uh, especially the South, and, and but you wouldn't just believe what these ladies are posting that they're killing. I couldn't believe it, but uh, uh, you know uh, the thought is tonight: uh, uh, what are the intents? Uh, if if people are posting what they're killing and what they're going for, you know there's some folks that are posting pictures uh, with the intent to kill, but it's not the game they want. It is a game, but it's not an animal. It's another human being. And as pastor, I must, be, I must warn you about this. To, they're, 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 they're seeking to use social media to draw people to themselves. If someone is, is trying to draw you to them, a person should never, a lady should never uh, dress inappropriately, or a man either, either way for that matter, to draw people's eyes or their attention uh, to themselves. No, uh, as Christians we're to uh, point others to Jesus. So, uh, you know, the thought is tonight to, uh, maybe these people are looking for something better, male or female. Uh, they're playing a game. They're good at it. They're experts uh, at this game. But let me warn you, when the lust runs out, hello, is anybody awake yet? Amen. I said when, the, when this lust runs out to uh, you better have somebody that loves God because, you know, beauty is vain. Favor is deceitful. Beauty is vain. But the woman that fears the Lord. In other words, we're all going to get wrinkled before it's over. We're all going to be hunched back before it's over. What you going to have when all the lust is gone, brother? Amen, brother Theo. <laughs> I just had to put it down on the bottom shelf tonight, brother Theo. This man right here prays for his pastor. He loves his pastor. I know you do too, but just keep praying. Amen. And so listen to Proverbs chapter number 6, verse 26. You didn't know you was going to get this at the end, the meat, right? The T-bone. For by, for by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. Hmm. It's a game. But listen to this. Here's the word. And the adulteress will hunt. Like us men going out there, won't be long, we'll be taking a trip down there to the camp, and we'll be looking for a deer. But it says this adulterous woman will hunt for the precious life as a person would go out and hunt like Nimrod did for a deer. There's people living on planet Earth today. That is their ambition in life. They're players. They want a niche in the belt. They're just in it for the fun of it. It's, and they're tearing up people's heart. Listen, again, we have many mighty hunters in the land. Woo! I'm just saying, make sure, hey, there's, there's, way, there's dating websites. They're making millions of dollars setting people up. Don't get caught in that game. That's not the one God wants for you. Now, the scripture makes it clear in Mark 8 36 if a man should gain the whole world and lose his own soul, what hath he profited if he gains a whole soul? If he's, if he's lost his soul and gained the whole world, what's he, 
why risk it? Amen? Why play the fool? Why allow Satan? Listen, Satan's the one on the hunt, isn't he? He's hunting for precious life. <laughs> Listen, uh, I, I recently went through my uh, friends list uh, and, and, and uh, anyone questionable, I blocked that person. I went through my wife's friends list. Anyone questionable? She said, go ahead, honey, I don't have nothing. You're my only love. Anyone questionable? You know why? We're in a brand new year. There's people out there hunting partners like we go hunt animals. They're wanting security. They're want whatever. It doesn't matter what they're after. It's of the devil. Would you believe since the invention of this social media, pastor has had to counsel with so many who's lost their marriages because boyfriend 40 years ago came asking for friendship on one of these uh, type of social medias. It goes both ways. Let me tell you what the Bible says. When lust hath conceived it bringeth forth sin. You better, get, you better cut it off right there. When lust hath conceived it bringeth forth sin. Why? Because when sin is finished. <laughs> it ain't just sin that Satan wants you to perform. When sin is finished, it says, it bringeth forth death. And so, Scripture also tells us to flee youthful lust. The problem with a lot of people in their 30s, in their 40s, in their 50s, 60s, 70s, it just keeps going. I asked my dad, I said, Dad, does it ever get any easier? We were talking about the lust problem. Mm -hmm. Don't look at me like that. You know you have problems with that. There is no temptation taking you than that which is what? Common to man. But will with the temptation. What do you say? God is faithful who will with the temptation. Make a way of. That's it. Uh, and, and He will not suffer us to be tempted above that which we are able. But, but, but all through their life, decades go by, and in their mind, they're still playing a game. They're still in high school. In their mind, they've never grown up right here. They've never matured right here. And they still want to flirt. They still want to play. They still want to dangle their little... Uh, you know, uh, their body uh, in front of people. Now, Christian, Nimrod was a mighty hunter. Don't be a hunter, a player for uh, the opposite sex. Don't be known as a lady killer. Don't be known as a man stealer. Don't be known as a home wrecker. Don't be known as someone, you know, Nimrod was known as a mighty hunter before the Lord. I don't think you could give, get glory uh, for your life if all you did was destroy people's lives, that would be a hurtful thing, wouldn't it? Let's bow our heads and ask the Lord to help us in these days in which we live because